everyone. I'm Emilia. I'm organizer of USD Meetup. I'm user experience designer. And the experience is what is shaping you. I'm not really an expert. I'm more like an immigrant. I grew up in Vladivostok, far east of Russia. I grew up in the uh, 90s, where it was uh, no country, no government. But there was community. Sure. And I believe in the power of community. I believe in the power of creative action. We coming together today is very important. I think we, we have to take all the worries of the um, sadness we see around us and put it into a creative action. So for me, my dream for uh, this year was to put together a conference. Uh, but for many reasons, I failed to do that. It was planned for this October. Now what we're doing is that we're putting it together in a very anti-fragile way in Hong Kong in January. So if you're interested, please join me in building this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump up here and say something? Yeah, Tara. Hi, my name is Tara. Uh, this is not what I do. Uh, just people keep saying we need laughter. So it's to be confirmed, I'm in an improv troupe and we're supposed to have a show tomorrow night. All of us have said yes, but if you're interested in coming and see and have laughters or know when the other shows come up, you can come and see me. If nobody knows what, if people don't know what improv is, uh, we have games are set up and then we have suggestion from the audience and then we just make up a scene on the go. So stupid, stupid things happen. Anyways, come and see me after the show if you're interested to know more. I'm Sasha. I just started teaching yoga recently, and so tonight at 6.30 in Sun Yat-sen Park by Sain Quinn Station, I'll be doing a free class. You guys are all welcome to join if you want to find me after. Thank you. So uh, let me share it with you. If you have a contact or if you have an idea or if you'd like to work with me on it, then please uh, get in touch. So the idea is that plastic bags are stupid because we all know that plastic bags suck, right? But fabric <laughs> bags suck too because you never have it with you when you need it. So what if you could just go to the grocery shor store and when you're checking out, pick up the bag that you need and then when you have that big mountain of bags in your, grocery uh, in your kitchen, return it to the store and somebody else can use it. That would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So my idea is to create a citywide cross-retailer network of bag sharing, uh, and I'd really like to work on it, but Hong Kong throws away 10 million plastic bags a day, and I can't tackle that myself. So if you have any ideas for me, then get in touch. <laughs> November, it's almost the end of the year. Um, if you work in the company with more than three people, you're gonna have an end of year party, Christmas celebration. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but if you are a freelancer, a solopreneur, or a fun employee, you don't have this opportunity. So I am starting a party of ones. <laughs> so this will be in mid December, where we will host a party, and we would like to invite anybody who doesn't have something to celebrate to come celebrate with us. Okay, so come find me afterwards. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else? Oh, hang on. Okay, last one here. Hi everyone, I'm Priyanka. I'm up to the party for one, please. Okay. Uh, I run a platform called Wise at Work, which is uh, for age inclusion of people over 50. We help them upskill and find work in Hong Kong. And I'd love for you to help out with teaching older people or older students. If you want to teach something, please let us know. 
and also we are innovation workshops for impact. So if you're interested to know more on how using Lego to help people solve big problems, reach me uh, reach out to me after this. Thank you. Oh, I am. We definitely want to give a lot of love to our sponsors, Fresh, um, who is founded by Paul over here, has been sponsoring us for almost three years now. I want to say. Yeah, at least 10. Um, we just want to recognize them because they've been astronomical support to us. Um, and Paul, do you want to come up and say a few words? Yeah, he pretends like he doesn't want to, but he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so five years for Creative Mornings in Hong Kong, which is, I think, truly fantastic. Um, quite often, good intentions start, and then the momentum sort of fails over time. And I think what's really, really cool is that with Creative Mornings, to be going for five years, 7,200 cups of coffee, which was not validated by us, but I'm sure that's right. <laughs> um, but actually to have 60 events like this is truly fantastic. And I think to see the number of people who have turned up for Creative Mornings last month and actually seen the same, uh, similar faces and new faces now, um, I think it's truly fantastic for all of us to sort of, you know, think life carries on as normal here in Hong Kong. And so Creative Mornings really is made up by the people who attend. And that's why I think the content and the inspiration comes from. So a little bit about Frederick Accounting. We are pretty much like a lot of um, business startups, people with ideas. You come to Hong Kong, or you work in a big company, you work in a small company, you start your own business, you find an idea. And really truly, I came to Hong Kong five and a half years ago. Um, through networks such as Creative Mornings, um, really just, you have an idea and you try and execute something. Um, we've been able to grow uh, as an accounting firm specializing in accounting software, Zero. We built a business that's grown from myself and a map book, which is like a lot of small businesses, to a team of 20 across Hong Kong and Singapore. And I think all of us here in Asia, there is such a huge opportunity for us to learn and also for us to share our experience with others. So if any of you feel that you need help or support with it, IT, marketing, accounting, always rather than trying to find a way of doing everything yourself, Try and find a person next to you or someone else who can help with your ideas and validate your ideas. Where you do need extra help, just try and find the partners that can support you. So again, it's a very strong community in Hong Kong. Um, and you know, whatever you're doing here, you're not alone. So the ideas that you have, you know, keep going with them and you know, keep attending creative mornings. And this is a fantastic event and I'll stop talking now. <laughs> but this is the third Creative Mornings um, in a row that he's been to. I'm keeping track. So um, thanks so much for, for making it today. Um, and we definitely want to say a big thanks to our sponsors, EF Education First. So Lydia, poor thing who's on crutches, is going to come up with OK, I can walk a bit. OK. Oh, she broke her leg. Lovely. Yeah. Can we get a, get a like, <laughs>
And sometimes all it takes to get outside your comfort zone is just really a simple hello. Hello, world. Hello, dawn. Hello, day. Hello, new time zones and new beginnings. Hello, hot. Hello, cold. Hello, old. Hello, new. Hello, sunscreen. Hello, face mask. Hello, fermented beverage. Hello, fermented shark. Hello, big. Hello, small. Hello, clad. And hello, scantily clad. Hello, acceptance. Hello, campus. Not too shabby. Hello, new language. Hello, new learning. Sorry, 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 sorry. Hello, leaders of tomorrow and change makers of today. Hello, dreams come true. Hello, nightmares. Hello, snack time. Hello, dessert. Hello, pink bus. Hello, pink boats. Hello, pink shirts. And that's enough of me. So that's a lot of what we do here, um, kind of in a nutshell. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of pink, it's a lot of exploring the world. Um, and here in Hong Kong, we have a lot of different teams, but as I mentioned, we are also a, a creative team, and every day we're thinking about how we can bring that mission of exploring the world, of opening the world through education to life through our products, through all the visuals that we use, um, and that's a really exciting journey to be a part of. Um, so if you guys are interested in following along with what we do, these are our central company social channels, um, we have a ton of employees here too if you want to talk with anyone. Um, and I just want to reiterate, so Diana and I, we talked throughout the week about whether we still wanted to have this event or whether it would be canceled. And I think we share the same sentiment that was, you know, in a time like this, community, um, people coming together, especially around positivity and support um, is really important. And so we were like, no, by all means, we still need to have this event. And that's something that EF stands for. And I'm glad that Creative Morning shares our mission as well. So thank you guys for all being here and making the trek out. I'm glad we have a full house. Um, thanks, guys, again. EF has been awesome. So this is our second event here. Um, my first one was a couple months ago. Uh, we also want to recognize our long-term partners. So Redback, we've already um, spoke about before. Uh, Toki and uh, Can Can from CMD Town unfortunately couldn't be here today just because of the transport situation. So um, overnight we asked our volunteers, uh, Alan and I believe Simon are snapping photos, which will be uploaded later. Yeah. So their new um, new career path. <laughs> <laughs> and a huge thank you to the team. We're all dressed in blue. That's not very distinguishing because a lot of you. You are as well. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for really pulling in and, and helping out. Um, without all of you, this definitely wouldn't be possible. So thanks so much, guys. Um, and without further ado, I want to introduce to you Lindsay. So Lindsay is someone I think we met. Where is Lindsay actually? There she is. I think we met um, because I want to say you emailed about the 30 second pitch, right? So she did a sharing um, as Ilya and a couple others did earlier. And then I looked deeper into her book and I was like, this is really interesting. Um, and it was perfect for this theme of lost because um, Lindsay will talk more to you about, you know, sort of the lost sunset industries of Hong Kong, but in a way it also allows us to find ourselves in deeper into the culture. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Lindsay Barty. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And just first of all, thank you very much for making it on this day, on this very difficult time. But I do think that it's really important that we share some positive messages during these times and remember some of the more positive and happy things about Hong Kong and why we all love the city. So I am going to talk to you about the theme of lost, a 
theme that I think we can all sort of relate to a little bit right now. Everyone's a little bit lost with what's going on, but um, hopefully I'll be able to bring you back to the love for Hong Kong. So I think there are two real um, elements of the theme of lost, two sides of it. The first being to have lost something, whether that's a person, an item, or in, or in the case of my book, um, cultures, whether these are traditions or customs or, or languages or something to do with a culture. And I would argue that there's an element of cultural identity which is endangered right now. Um, the other aspect of loss is this idea of feeling lost. This is very silly picture from um, The idea of feeling lost is this idea of alienation. As Karl Marx put it, there are four aspects of alienation. Alienation from nature, alienation from people, alienation from your work, and alienation from yourself. And it was this alienation from myself which sort of drove this idea of this identity crisis that a lot of people like myself have that perhaps inspired me to write this book. I'll explain that a bit more, but for anyone that recognizes the term third culture kid, you will know what I mean. And that's when you are from a place and your, your parents from other places, but you're not sure whether you fit in here or somewhere else or what you're doing. But it's this idea that really inspired me to learn more about Hong Kong, which for me is my home and where I feel like I'm from, and give me a greater sense of belonging and attachment to the city. So without further ado, my book is Sunset Survivors. Meet the people keeping Hong Kong's traditional industries alive. And there's some over there for those that have had the chance to have a look or you can have a look afterwards. But the book is 30 different interviews with different craftsmen and women around Hong Kong. These craftsmen and women are running some of the oldest, most traditional industries that have been in Hong Kong for many, many years. Now, I think there are a lot of books that focus on old Hong Kong. A lot of books that focus on beautiful black and white pictures of the old harbor, of rituals, of old colonial buildings, of a Hong Kong that is gone, that is already lost. And what I wanted to do was take a look at the living history of Hong Kong, draw our attention to the old Hong Kong elements that are still here today in modern Hong Kong. The old Hong Kong elements that we can get out and we can actually see in the city right now it's like that sort of very common dilemma of after your grandparents pass away, you suddenly have all of these questions that you wish that you'd ask them. You suddenly wish that you'd video them. You suddenly wish that you could document them and, and record their memories, but it's too late. So what I wanted to do was say, don't wait till it's too late. Too late. We have to go and have a look now at these people and what they're doing. And I wanted to focus on their stories because we can have books, we can have museums, we can have textbooks that will record these people's sort of industries, but these people's personal stories and the people themselves will not be around for much longer. So for me, it's very important that we get out there and see them. So a little bit about me. This is me. Um, I've written this book, I've written other books too. I'm a journalist and writer in the city. Um, some of you may know that I'm also a rugby player. So for seven years, I was a professional rugby player in Hong Kong, and one of my teammates is here today, the front coming, so she knows all about it. But I think it's given me a really wonderful, by the way, there is no nice picture of anybody playing rugby, so this is <laughs> kind. It's just us running away from Sri Lanka. Um, but anyway, there's it's given me a really wonderful opportunity to represent my home in two different ways, and I really think that that's founded my love for Hong Kong just a little bit more. But this is me as a child. I, again, I cannot explain the outfit. It's just uh, parents will dress you in whatever they want when you're young. But I think the picture is, uh, it goes to show again that my love for Hong Kong has been, ever since I was a child, this is me showing my cousins me drying seafood on one of the outlying islands of, of Hong Kong. Of Hong Kong. And uh, my mother is Macanese, so she's Portuguese Chinese, but she's five generations Hong Kong. My father is British, but came to Hong Kong on a boat from England when he was just six years old. So my parents have been in Hong Kong a very, very long time. And they wanted my brother and I to have a more authentic Hong Kong upbringing because
as like many people from a Western sort of style family, you can live many, many years in Hong Kong and not really get to know what they would call the real Hong Kong. So they wanted to sort of burst that bubble and take my brother and I out to experience the things that they regarded as real Hong Kong when we were young. So as young kids, my mom would take us to Shang Shui Po to eat congee with locals in the small sort of local eateries there. Um, we would have thousand year old egg in our congee and it wouldn't make a big deal about it. She was like, that was just normal. Uh, all of our groceries were bought from work markets, so we would always, she would take us there and she would make us do all of the uh, bargaining with the people. She would get us to know all the wet market workers. Um, my mother always told me that if it's not moving, it's not fresh. <laughs> so, you have to buy a dead fish, yeah. So we would definitely, but, and I would relish, you know, taking this bag of wriggling prawns home on my lap in a car. And it was just, it became normal to me. She didn't want it to be like a, oh, we're going for a cultural meeting out to the wet market. It was just normal. That was where shopping was done. My father would take us to some of the dodgiest areas of Hong Kong to go and get haircuts or go and get our shoes fixed or buy fish from Tom Choi Street for our fish, uh, fish tank. All of these things they did to try to give us a more authentic Hong Kong upbringing. My mom also encouraged us to speak Cantonese as much as we could. She got a Chinese ama as well at home so that we had this constant auntie who was speaking to us in Cantonese to try to help us improve our language skills. And I think for all of these reasons, I again fell in love with Hong Kong. But I don't know how many of you have lived in Hong Kong for a long time, were brought up here, or have simply been here for a few years or even months. But a lot of the sights and smells of old Hong Kong, the sights and smells that I fell in love with as a kid, have changed dramatically over the years. But there will always be some things that remind me of Hong Kong. This is um, a couple selling roasted chestnuts on the street. The smell of roasted chestnuts will forever remind me that Hong Kong winter is on its way. But there are also so many other things about Hong Kong that remind me of home. Along with the smell of roasted chestnuts, you have the smell of the stinky tofu from the Dai Pai Dong, which you can also smell. And it's not the most pleasant of smells, but it certainly reminds you of home. But there's the clattering of mahjong tiles from neighborhood flats or from your own flat if you play. There's the sounds and smells of Hong Kong that really, when you know you're a Hong Konger, like, when you're standing on the side of the street and you can tell whether it's just a normal car or a taxi by that slight rattling noise of the taxi. <laughs> That's when you know you're a Hong Konger. And I think it was these things that really um, like, and made me realize that this was my home. But it was one man, and one man in particular, that inspired the writing of this book. And I'll call him the White Flower Man. Some of you may have seen him around as well. At the bottom of Lang Kwai Fong, outside the Prada, the coach buildings, all of these, you know, very billion dollar shop windows. There was an old elderly Chinese gentleman dressed in traditional linen clothes, and around his neck he had a small cardboard tray of white flowers that he was selling to the public. And as you can imagine, central every day, there were thousands of businessmen and women, all dressed up in their business attire, rushing to and from their offices, most of them just ignoring this man's presence. He was selling these $10 flowers, just a small sort of token of a bygone era in Hong Kong. And every day I would see this man as I walked to the MTR. And my dad would often buy a flower which he would put in his top bucket. And it was a sweet smelling flower and I always knew that he'd been past the man when I would see the flower in his pocket. You might recognize these flowers from the taxis. They often have a string of these white flowers in the taxis. Anyway, one day my dad came home and there was no flower in his pocket. And the next morning, when I walked down to the MTR, there was no man either. This man was gone forever and I would never ever see him again. And it was at that moment that I realized that these people, there's a whole host of these people running these old traditional jobs and once they're gone, they're gone forever and they take a slice of Hong Kong's cultural identity with them. So, Upon a bit of research, I discovered that there were many more like him, and they weren't running jobs or they weren't running services that were essential in modern society in modern Hong Kong. They weren't running anything that we needed necessarily. 
these people, oh, this is the, an old lady that I saw recently who was selling these white flowers. So somebody's continuing uh, that man's legacy, but perhaps not in the cardboard beautiful box, in this lovely polystyrene box. But anyway, <laughs> this is a face threader. And this is one of the jobs that I started to find out about. So these people weren't selling iPhones or anything essential that we needed. These people were face threading. These people were shoe shining outside the MTR in Central. You've probably seen them. These people were sharpening knives. These people were making paper effigies. These people were doing all manner of jobs, traditional trades, that no, we don't need on an everyday basis. But they were upholding uh, an element of Hong Kong tradition and keeping these, this Hong Kong's very special cultural identity alive in their own way. And of course, they've been pushed out by things like housing rents, by a change of uh, cultural beliefs, by modern technology, by factories opening up and replacing their jobs entirely, which is why I wanted to call them the sunset survivors, because I could have called it something really negative, like the old dying dregs of Hong Kong. It's <laughs> not such a catchy title, but I wanted to give them a more positive spin, because these people have persisted despite all of these changes in Hong Kong, and these are the last people that remain, the last craftsmen and women of their trades. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to four survivors from the book. The first one being Mr. Lan Lo Yik. This was perhaps my favorite interview in the book. Now, Mr. Lan is one of Hong Kong's very last letter writers. I'm not sure if everybody here has heard of a letter writer, so for those that don't know, in the 50s and 60s of Hong Kong, Hong Kong had a literacy rate of just 60%. So a huge portion of society couldn't read and write. And for those that couldn't, you had to seek the help of a letter writer to help you correspond with your relatives in mainland China or overseas, to help you write the letters, to help you read the letters as well, to help you apply for any welfare um, applications or government funding or anything that you may need. So these people were seen as very highly regarded professionals, educa highly educated professionals. And there were once thousands, hundreds if not thousands of letter writers in Hong Kong working all over the city, gathered around popular buildings or temples or shrines, things like this. Today, there are just six remaining letter writers left in Hong Kong. And Mr. Leung is one of them. He works in the Yamate Jade Market. Now, many people have been to the jade market, but not many of you would have realized that down this very side of the market, there are these six remaining letter writers confined to this one dark corner of the jade market with very few people asking for their service. Today, he says they get about one customer a week, if they're lucky. But one time of the year when they do get a few more customers is around March, April time, at the end of the tax year. Because today, they help people with their tax reports. But they <laughs> it is confusing. So. Um, but he is a fascinating man himself. He's originally from Vietnam. He escaped Vietnam in the 1970s and came to Hong Kong in search of a better life. He worked as a bartender in Hong Kong and quickly picked up Cantonese and Mandarin. He had also taught himself English in Vietnam because he was working for Columbia Pictures as an account secretary and taught himself English by reading the scripts that would come onto his desk every day. Huh. He's a fascinating man because he speaks five languages. Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, English, and most notably, absolutely fluent French, because it's from Vietnam. But that really took me by surprise when I was in the middle of the uh, Yamate Jade Market and this man was tapping on his typewriter, typing in completely fluent French. And I, I questioned it and I learned French at uni. Please don't test me. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I chatted with him for a little bit, and sure enough, he was absolutely fluent. So it was a really amazing thing. Now, I mentioned that he helped do um, services for people who wanted to write letters to their families, but he also helped people with translations. And interestingly, for a lot of British sailors that fell in love with local prostitutes. Um, so he's written some pretty sordid material in his time, which he said he'd not really like to go over. He doesn't do that anymore for anyone, hoping. Um, letter writers in Hong Kong, they all continue to use typewriters. Many of them have never used a computer a day in their lives. They have no interest in using modern technology or changing the way that they do things. Um, and the main reason, which they told me recently, was because ink cartridges for printers and 
carbon technology are far too expensive. So they continue to use the carbon paper and four bed typewriters, which is much cheaper. Now I interview all of them and I brought up one quote from each which sums up either their plight or their character. The development of technology like smartphones and computers is the biggest enemy of our industry, but at the same time, it is essential for any society to improve with time. There must be some jobs that are replaced or even eliminated, and I think we are one of them. Now, one of the things I learned from all the interviews was that these people weren't necessarily sad that their industry was dying, and they definitely weren't ignorant to it. They were perfectly aware that their, a lot of their jobs had become very redundant in a modern society. And Mr. Lern, I asked him why he didn't want to retire, because his family were urging him to retire and take some time off. But like many people in Hong Kong, he lives in a very tiny, tiny flat with a lot of people in his family. And if he were to retire, he would have to go to his flat and spend all of his days in this cramped flat without any sense of purpose. So working, even if he only has one customer a week, gives him a sense of purpose and something to do every day and gets him out the house. Now the next person I want to introduce you to is Miss Irene Lee. Now some of you might recognize her for where she is. Irene is the owner and waitress at Sing Hong Yin Tai Pai Dong in Central. Um, has anybody been there? Just out of interest? Yeah. Towards Aberdeen Street, Gough Street kind of area and in the back streets of Central. Now the Tai Pai Dong, for those that know, is I'd say Hong Kong's most iconic eatery a sort of no frills, outdoor eatery, plastic chairs, tables, just very, very simple, serving up Hong Kong classic dishes. Hong Kong style French toast is a, is a hit, always. Um, not the healthiest, but delicious. <laughs> um, and all sorts of rice and noodle dishes, but Irene's most famous dish that she's become famous for is her tomato macaroni broth, which she proudly holds here. Again, there were once thousands of Dai Pai Dong on every street corner in Hong Kong. All over the city, you could find these outdoor eateries, and they were very commonly um, frequented by businessmen and everybody, everybody in Hong Kong. The government no longer issues licenses for Dai Pai Dong because they're seen as unhygienic and they take up space for development. So today, there are just 25 remaining Dai Pai Dong. Dai Pai Dong licenses only can be passed down one time. The current holders of these licenses are all the second generation owners of the license, so they can no longer be passed down anymore. So these final 25 Dai Pai Dong are the very last of their kind. So if you do have a chance, <coughs> get out and see them while you can. She's watched many people grow up in her Dai Pai Dong. There was a young boy that used to come when he was about five years old, and she saw him when he got a bit older bring his first girlfriend to her Dai Pai Dong. And he asked her to serve them nicely so that he looked cool. She said. <laughs> she did. And it must have worked because they got married. And he's now in his 40s, he's a lawyer, and he has children which he brings to the Dai Pai Dong. So these Dai Pai Dong have a real spirit of Hong Kong. They have a real character, unlike a lot of other restaurants which you might only go to one time. And as I sat interviewing her, all sorts of people were walking by, and she was waving to them and wishing them good morning. So it really made me feel sad that this Dai Pai Dong would not last much longer. But of course, Dai Pai Dong workers, even if they do have children, one of the main problems with keeping these industries alive is that they have no willing successes. Her children have gone to school, have gone to university. Her daughter is now in university in Australia. Their children have no intention of becoming Dai Pai Dong workers or letter writers, even if the license was available. A quote from Irene. People often think we are rude, but that's just the Dai Pai Dong style. <laughs> so if you've ever been to a Dai Pai Dong, you'll know that your order just gets screamed across the room, and uh, across the outdoor area, I should say, and uh, your dinner is slapped upon the table, but that is just the sort of boisterous charm of Hong Kong, and I think that really summed that up for me, and I really I enjoyed the way she served me. She would like, normally come over and directly translate it, they'd just be like, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> <Customer service. laughs> um, the next person I'd like to introduce you to is Mr. Chan Lok Choi. And you can see one of his creations here. Mr. Chan is the last remaining craftsman of bamboo bird cages in Hong Kong. The very last man that knows how to make them completely from scratch. 
He started to learn this skill when he was just 13 years old and he's been doing it ever since. Now the procedure of making a bamboo bird cage is a very delicate one. It can take him up to two months and he has to delicately bend these bamboo rods. He has to drill these tiny little holes into the bottom of the bamboo cage and not with a drill, I might add, but with a, uh, an old Chinese apparatus. It's very difficult to explain. I'll talk about that later. Um, but he currently works in the Yunpro Bird Garden in Prince Edward, if anybody's ever been there. Um, and today, he says he very rarely makes cages from scratch because factories in China have completely um, pushed him out of business. They can produce hundreds in a day, whereas he takes two months to make one. So he typically will just um, help people fix their bird cages um, if they need it. Now, if anybody's been to the parks uh, early in the morning in Hong Kong, or has been in Hong Kong for a while, you may remember uh, or have seen these elderly Chinese men that would carry their bird cages around with a small bird in it, listening to the bird song. And often they would hang these birds up in a tree, which was called taking your bird for a walk, <laughs> kind of, um, whilst they played mahjong or just read a newspaper underneath it. And this was a very common sight in Hong Kong until 2012. Some of you will remember, but bird flu hit Hong Kong. And when it did, many people did not want to keep a bird in their home any longer, did not want to be around birds just in case. Birds were also not allowed on public transport anymore. So this tradition of keeping a bird or taking your bird for a walk was hugely dampened, as was Mr. Chan's trade. So I asked Mr. Chan, what he wanted out of his job, because he knew that he was on the way up. He said personally that he only had five or 10 years left, max. And all he wanted was to become a master. I would love to have an apprentice, but no one with a school education seems interested in learning these handicraft skills anymore. He wasn't sad that his business would die. He was just sad that the skill of bamboo bird cage making would be lost from Hong Kong. He is desperate for an apprentice. Now, not to give away any spoilers for later, but um, where's Karen? Karen with CKLO, right. She has put together a series of workshops and uh, things and has got Mr. Chan to finally uh, convince him to teach a few people with the craft of not just bamboo board cage <coughs> making, but bamboo work. And I think that that's made him incredibly happy. Now, the last person I wanted to introduce you to is Mr. Aoyoung Ping Chi. And does anybody know what he is doing? <laughs> Wrestling a cat. Yeah, that was, that was a, the cat would not get out the photo, but then it turned out quite nice. Festival lights, kind of? Yes, that's right. So he is a paper effigy maker, and he is hand crafting paper effigies. And for those that don't know, there is a traditional Chinese cultural belief that when somebody passes away, you can have these paper recreations of real life things made, and then when you burn them, they go as offerings to your deceased relative in the afterlife. Now, Mr. Aoyang has been doing this for a very long time. He's actually the fourth generation owner of his family business. As with many of the um, people in the book, they are the family business, uh, third or fourth generation owners of these businesses. Um, now, typically, the things that he would make in the past were money, um, shoes, a house, perhaps a servant for the afterlife. These were very common things. And one of the things you can see here in the corner is a giant Darth Vader helmet. So <laughs> somebody found that essential in the afterlife. But each, each of his creations can take weeks and weeks to make and will cost thousands of dollars. Um, he has to, again, paint these bamboo rods, put the joss paper on them, um, bend them, dress paper, paint them, decorate them, make them look incredibly lifelike. And as you can imagine, factories in China have opened up and completely taken over this business, creating not these beautifully crafted bamboo recreations, but more like a, a paper net fold-up recreation of a lot of these things, or just a very simple version of it. So he lost out a lot to factories in China, but which can make things a lot faster. But saying that, today he takes very special requests. So. He has made, in his time, a life-size massage chair. <laughs> he has made a giant martial arts Wing Chun dummy. He has made an electric guitar for 
Um, if anybody remembers the band Beyond, and there was a, a rock star called Coma who tragically fell off stage. So it was Mr. Al Young himself that created the electric guitar that went to him in the afterlife. Um, he's also created, when I was there, this is something that he was making, um, a Nintendo game console. And essential for, you know, passing away the hours in the afterlife. But you can see the one on the left, this one here, is completely made of paper. The one on the right is real. So you can see just how incredibly realistic these things become. And once you put the sticker on the front, you honestly couldn't tell the difference. So he really puts a lot of heart and effort into each of these creations. And I asked him, after weeks and weeks of work, would he feel sad to see his creations go up in flames? Um, I thought it was a valid question. And he said no, because he truly, truly believes that each of these creations lives on forever in the afterlife. And that really touched me because a lot of why, a lot of the reason why these industries are dying is because there's a change of cultural beliefs and a lot less people genuinely believe these things are happening anymore. So it was very nice to hear that he genuinely did. So as I said, the majority of uh, requests in the past were obviously money, but also a house or a, a, maybe a servant for the afterlife or a pair of shoes. And uh, the majority of requests today, if you think about it, if anybody know what the majority of requests today would be for gifts for the afterlife, iPhones, iPads, laptops, Gucci handbags, and uh, all manner of uh, materialistic items. These are the things that are Rolex watches, and not just iPhones and iPads, but the chargers too. Yeah, you gotta charge it up. Yeah. Incredible, I know. And so after this talk about how materialistic the world had become, and especially how Hong Kongers were so obsessed with these very materialistic things, I asked Mr. Al Young what he might want in the afterlife. When I die, I would like some cars, houses, and a high-rise system. A super deluxe seven-foot-long Mercedes Benz in the So I was a little bit taken aback by that comment. Um, oh, okay, all right. So, but actually, Mr. Al Young is one of the people that um, continues to uh, keep his traditional skill alive by going to primary schools and community centers around Hong Kong to teach the skill of a paper effigy making to young children and uh, teach them about the trade. Now, I realize I'm running out of time here, so I'll just quickly run you through. There are a lot of old industries in Hong Kong, some that are already lost, and I don't think we necessarily have to be sad that all of them are gone. I don't think anybody really wants to become a rickshaw driver in today's world or bring that back for any means. But there are also lots of other jobs that you might not realize are gone, such as tram conductors, bus and tram conductors, before the age of coin boxes or octopus cards. Of course, there was a man on board that would go around collecting and issuing tickets. Um, these are Hong Kong's pig farms. Um, so, Kaduri Company brought in pig farms, and instead of getting money, if you applied for government funding, you would get a pig and a series of pigs to help you establish your first pig farm, um, which is something that a lot of people didn't really know about Hong Kong. Um, does anybody know what this lady is doing here? She is something that is called a stone cutter. You may have heard of Stone Cutters Island or a stone breaker. So before large machinery came in to build quarries in Hong Kong, to, to make quarries, you didn't have these giant machines that could cut away at the rock. You had people. So the men, typically, the whole family would help out. The men, or is arguably women can be stronger, but at this time, this men would generally take care of the largest boulders, right? Um, the women would take care of the, of the large rocks and make them into small rocks, and then children would help out too, breaking the smallest rocks into tiny stones, and that was how quarries were broken down. This man, does anyone know what he's doing? Not the most pleasant of jobs. He is what's called a night soil collector, when I give talks to schools, this is the one they always find the most interesting. <laughs> but uh, before sanitation came into Hong Kong um, and toilets were established in households, you had what was known as a honey pot, which is a very nice name given to a very horrible thing. Um, a honey pot in each household, which you would fill during the day and leave out at night. And these night soil collectors would come and collect these pots, take them to a ferry pier, they'd be taken away on a boat and dumped on an island. Um, and this is one of the many jobs which I'm pretty sure we can all be glad 
has been lost from Hong Kong. Um, but like I said, yes, there are many things that are gone already, so we don't always have to be sad. I mean, I don't think that we are sad that, you know, the ivory trade or shark's fin soup is hopefully on the way out in Hong Kong. But I think it's all of these things, whether or not we're happy or sad that they're being lost, have all made up part of Hong Kong's cultural identity and, and Hong Kong's sort of in industrial history. For the 30 interviews that I did, I tried the service or tried to buy something from each place. So uh, here is me getting my face threaded, which is incredibly painful procedure. But so traditionally, you know, people have heard of eyebrow threading today, but actually traditionally you would have your entire face threaded before your wedding to open the bride's face to the groom. And there are still people that you know, continue this tradition in Hong Kong, and there's this lady that continues to run the shop. Um, this is where I got my hair cut by this Shanghainese barber who first came to Hong Kong in the 50s and found an old watermelon and practiced his uh, beard shaving blade skills on the watermelon to make sure he didn't make any nicks in the, in the watermelon. This is probably the worst haircut I've ever had in my life, but um, <laughs> it was uh, traditional, nonetheless. Um, and uh, on the right there is me and the lovely Mrs. Ho, who's on my walking tour, which I now give, who makes these uh, traditional scales that you'll often see in the wet market, that were a long time ago used to measure everything from gold, silver, opium, and herbal medicine, all the way up to uh, fishermen measuring their catch out at sea. Um, it's given me a wonderful opportunity to give back to these people. Um, Obviously, I gave them all a book so they know what is going on when people come by their shops. And I spoke to them all, um, and they were incredibly happy that people were just recognizing and respecting what they had given to Hong Kong's cultural identity. So, as I mentioned, I now give walking tours to uh, people in Hong Kong to go and visit some of these shops and people around Hong Kong and actually get to hear their story firsthand. Because I think that even for people that have lived in Hong Kong a very long time and think they know Hong Kong culture well, it's not often that you actually get to go into these shops and talk to the people firsthand and really get to know their stories. And I think I encourage you all, in the spirit of this theme of today, to go and get lost in Hong Kong in order to find out just a bit more about your own culture and your own home or your adopted home, however, whatever the case may be. And I just want to finish on a message. Um, as the, I think Hong Kong culture is, is all around us. And even though I say there are elements of it being lost, I think Hong Kong culture is something that is, is all around us whether you realize it or not. And it's everything from, obviously you're looking at dim sum and, and yum cha, these kind of things that you know, you've been to. And these are very obvious things. But it's everything from the crowded MTR. It's everything from the crazy taxi drivers that you see in Hong Kong. It's everything from super modern buildings um, that businessmen and women are going to, but they take an ancient ferry to get there. It's everything from a place where you hand over your business card with two hands, and yet you can burp out loud and that be completely <laughs> acceptable. Um, it's a place where there's often not a fourth floor on a hotel building. It's a place where you have to know never to give a clock as a present. These are all elements of Hong Kong culture that we're not losing and that are always around us. So I think despite losing some of these sunset industries, we can also um, take pride in the fact that Hong Kong culture is all around us as well. Um, and aspects of it are inevitably leaving. But people often ask why am I so focused on this um, idea of old traditional cultures and if it's, if it's dying, if it's going, then why focus so much on it? Why focus on these outdated subjects? But as the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, her greatest fear was that as we drift towards a more generic worldview, not only would we see the entire range of the human imagination reduced to a narrow modality of thought, but that we would awaken one day as if from a dream, having forgotten that there were even other possibilities. So that's in a fight against globalization. I think Lastly, Hong Kong is a beautiful place. Hong Kong is a beautiful place, a unique place, steeped in local customs, traditions, and quirks. And before these things disappear, I urge you to get out and discover them. And I promise you, I promise you, you will feel more connected to the city than ever before and a little bit less lost. Thank you very much.
So as I said, when I was growing up, I really, my mom would take me to a lot of these different stores. So when I got a bit older and I noticed that a few of them were leaving, uh, were disappearing, I would noted, you know, oh, the guy outside the wet market, he's not there anymore, or this guy's not there. So I'd go and try and find those ones. But um, a lot of the industries I didn't actually know about before I started researching the book. So my, as I said, I play rugby, and most of my rugby teammates are local Hong Kong. Chinese, and they um, they told me about some of them, and they actually, for some of the people in the book, they were relatives or friends of my rugby teammates, like the traditional pawn shop owner, P-A-W-N, for anyone um, The traditional pawn shop owner uh, is actually my friend's, our teammate's father, so that's kind of one of the very special reasons why we're allowed to go inside the pawn shop on the walking tour and talk to him about all of these things, because there's a whole idea of saving face where you wouldn't normally go into a traditional pawn shop and get to ask these things. So. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Um, many of the things you mentioned touched me deeply, but one of the things you mentioned is that Irene is serving macaroni with Bosch, and Bosch is a traditional Ukrainian dish. And uh, um, I was growing up in Far East of Russia, and I didn't know my history because it's not a common thing in a communist country to talk about your family. But much later, my grandpa started to dig in, and he's Ukrainian. And um, what we learned is that a lot of people actually immigrated in 1920 to uh, Shanghai first, and then to uh, first to Korea, and to Shanghai, and then to Hong Kong, and then to Japan and California. So this dish, Bosch, come to Hong Kong from seems to be from Far East of Russia and originated in Ukraine. I wonder if you if you dig into this story, do, do, do you have more to share about that? Well, you're exactly right. So Hong Kong is a very multicultural place, you know, and I think that even though you have 90 something percent Chinese population, actually there's so many different influences from all sorts of different places. Um, and Bosch is a perfect example of um, an influence from the Russian population that were you know, once a much larger population in Hong Kong. Ukrainian. Yeah, Ukrainian too, okay. <laughs> sorry. But, um, but no, there was a population of um, people that would bring all sorts of different uh, cultural elements, and food is just one example. You, you, look, you walk around Hong Kong and look at some of the food items in, in Dai Pai Dong, or also any restaurants in Hong Kong, and you see lots of different cultural influences. And I think that's one obvious example. Yes. I will ask her next time I go where she got the inspiration. <laughs> So many of these industries are stunt industry. Do you feel like there's any way of keeping them? Um, it's a really good question. Are there any ways of keeping these sunset industries alive? Um, I think that some people have done a really great job to uh, sort of repurpose, upcycle, or give a new life to some of these old industries. Um, everyone's seen the minibus um, sign guy that's been making new keychains and things like this for with his traditional style. Um, uh, Billy in the front here has done a great job to upcycle a lot of uh, old uh, traditional industries and, and give new purpose to a lot of um, older Hong Kong items. Uh, and obviously CK Elo, who I know are going to uh, speak after us, they've uh, given new life to a lot of these old traditional uh, craftsmen and women as well, and, and given their traditional industry is more of a modern twist. So I think there's ways of doing it, but for most of the people that I interviewed, they were very reluctant to um, make any sort of modern adaptation of their, of their business. Most of them were just saying, you know, I've got five to 10 years left of doing my business. I just want to see out my final few years doing what I've always done. They often didn't have an interest in uh, changing anything now. Too much effort, they said. <laughs> yeah, can I understand that? Uh, so, in my own experience talking to such people, they're sometimes quite resistant. Uh, what is your way of uh, gaining their trust and uh, sort of getting them to, to open up to you? Um, that's a very good point. A lot of them, um, people that I approached, were just not interested in being in the book or, or have it being interviewed, and those people I would just leave alone. And then I've shot on a guy who only told me that after I brought him like 20 knives. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, a lot of the time was it was me approaching them, and I think they were a bit taken aback by the fact that there was this um, white girl speaking some pretty terrible Cantonese. Um, 
I speak okay Cantonese, but it's, it's often pretty bad. And they were, it, I guess it was bad enough to be endearing. So I think they um, <laughs> thought that it was quite amusing, so they would give me the time. But as I said, I always bought something from their shop, or I always tried their service. So like my interview with the Shanghainese barber was during my haircut. And I think that they were more um, okay with doing the interview and more inclined to do it if I was trying their service and helping support their, their business whilst I was doing it. And I always said to them that I'm interviewing you because, not because you're a dying trade and because I want to showcase you as a dying trade, but because I feel like you represent for me what is the real Hong Kong and people should know about it before you disappear. In the Shanghainese barber shop, every single barber in that shop was over 75 years old. And as they pass away, nobody's replacing them. They used to have about 30 different people working there, now they have about six guys. And they're, a lot of them, I don't think they can see what they're doing. <laughs> they got redone a couple months later when I finally accepted it. Was, it was bad. <laughs> oh yes, so I have a free copy of the book to give to one lucky person. Um, and I want to ask people, what, if you can find a good way to define lost and whatever lost means to you, if anybody can define that, you can win a book. Fantastic prize. Hey. Does anybody find, can anybody find a good definition of what lost means to them? It doesn't have to be in reference to cultural identity, it can be in, in any way. I've been lost for the last seven years. Just back to Hong Kong four days ago after seven years of traveling. And I think lost is a, is a journey of discovery, of things, yes. <laughs> of yourself, of anything. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's what I feel or like the meaning about lost to myself because I think many people ask me like, uh, why did you travel for so long? Or what do, why do you travel so long? Like, I don't know, I'm lost, but I think I'm looking for something. I'm discovering something. Yes. I like that. Thank people. Thank you. I think I resonate with that as well. Just constantly trying to justify where is your home? Where are you fitting in? You know, where are you going? And then for me to be back here and during the process of doing these interviews, I really did feel a lot more connected to home. So if that's going to help, maybe. Um, does anybody else have a definition? And then I'll just pick. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I do resonate with that, um, with the discovery. But I've also found being lost is, for some reason, when you're growing up, everybody's telling you to be something and you don't know any better between your family, society, school and all that and there's all this chatter going on but you don't pay attention to who you are inside and that's completely ignored until by chance, by yourself or you're just fed up with everything else you go stop and so you've been, I've had the same thing about three years ago I just decided to be really curious and pay attention to what I wanted and from then on, it was like, wait, this is what really brings me joy, makes me happy, lifts me up. And from then on, I was like, okay, pay attention, pay attention to what I want um, and not all the chatter around. So yeah, being lost amongst all the chatter until you pay attention to what's within, really. lost is um, when I think about being nostalgic of the past and that the possibility is not going to happen in the future and therefore I reflect on what I have right now and treasure and, and being um, uh, grateful for what I have. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, a very tough choice, but I think it's going to go to the brave first lost Yay. definer. And <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good. So, um, thank you. And if anybody would like to have a look at the book or buy a book, there's one over there. Uh, I've got a whole box there, but no pressure. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your walking tours and if you're still down Sure. I am 
am doing them this week in a little tough. Um, but yeah, I will be running them more so in January now. So I'll put all the dates on the website, sunsetsurvivors.com. And um, you can just join either a group tour or run a private tour if you have a group of friends that you can do together. It's about $400 a person. Um, and it's two hours walking through Yamate or some other areas of Hong Kong and you get to visit about four or five people from the book and get to see them and chat with them in their place of work and learn a bit more about their lives and their, their work. Thank you. Ask me more about it later if you'd like. Yeah. Great, can we get a, a final round of applause for the for like another 10 minutes, because we've got, unless you have to go to work, totally understand. Um, I'd like to welcome Karen from CKLO to talk about um, what they're doing on these lost crafts of, of Hong Kong. Um, so hi, hi everyone, and thank you, Diana, for this opportunity, and sorry for stealing you like 10 minutes from the main way. Um, so we're going to do a very quick sharing on how we use our own way to grow with our local craft by giving them like new meanings and purpose with sprinkle rainbows and actually more than art. We're actually CKLO. Um, we are an art and design studio where we collaborate with artists and designers on our um, projects and um, for us art is actually for all it should be like everywhere for everyone we don't think that art should be like appreciated in museums or gallery settings only where everyone is so well dressed up making very com sophisticated comments it should be like for kids for like anyone who doesn't understand it as well so by doing that we actually um, have been launching some uh, local art, um, non-profit art programs that collaborates with local fading craft masters and artists that is uh, from locally and internationally so that we can um, actually give them a platform for more exposure and also like to raise awareness to these um, different crafts. And uh, last year we had the opportunity to do um, an exhibition called My Light, My Food. It is a neon light exhibition where we collaborated with six different local and international artists and we also collaborated with one of the last remaining uh, neon light master. Mm. And um, by collaborating with the artists, we realized that um, we actually find a new way in how to transform these kind of local fading craft, like especially like for neon light. We only see them uh, for commer like commercially on the street, but like with the rise of LED signs, like they're actually, like they basically don't have any jobs anymore. So like even when we were like visiting our neon light master, it was in the night of like after the typhoon market, if you guys remember typhoon number 10, so all of the, a lot of neon lights were broken and all the jobs he got is just to repair these days. Like he doesn't take any new jobs anymore. So for us, it was a very good opportunity to collaborate with him. And actually we asked our artists to draw or like uh, to use their own artistic medium or approach to um, express their own way of different Hong Kong neighborhoods. And we are using a touch of the neon light as an accent to the work. So we're not transforming the whole work as a new neon piece, but to actually to add it as an extra medium to the artist's like uh, original approach. And it has been like really quite interesting. And we are also showing how the Neon Light Master is doing his work. He's actually um, 70 years old, and he's the very last remaining like Neon Light Master, like I was saying. And this is actually the first public video that you can see. And the progress is very interesting as um, we've learned that he only works with a certain way. Like even when you see, we were trying to do um, an AI version of a line of how the neon would be made. But normally he would only use hand-drawn paintings so of the exact width of the neon light. So even for him, it's a very new and modern way to draw the neon light that he's gonna make. And recently I have visited his studio. He's using this new method like that he adapted from us as well.
And um, today we are very honored to also invite two of our artists that participated in the exhibition um, to talk to us about their work. And the button doesn't work. Okay, yeah. And the first one will be Fred. Um, he did a piece called The Sleeper in the Veil, where he can talk to us a bit about the artwork and his collaboration with the master. Yeah, hey, morning. Uh, I'll be talking more about like the a uh, process more than uh, the piece itself. I uh, can try to find an answer to the question is how we can have these uh, old talents, old crafts to survive. So who can be interested by it? And I do she invite artists and we are interested by these crafts. And um, the way she met, uh, she organized workshops when we have to spend a lot of time with uh, the master. Sometimes it went way too much. I think for me it's like 20 times, but Actually, it's how we start to connect with the person itself and how this person spent all his life to, um, to master a craft. So uh, we spent time with uh, the new master to make this piece. Currently, I'm learning from uh, the birdcage master that Mr. Chen just saw before from the Lindsay Plantation. Um, and I guess it's a way to transmit uh, craft throughout disappearing and to, to keep them. So once they will be here, I'll be here, or Felix, or others. Uh, I'll be here to continue to use this craft and hopefully to share uh, to a new generation. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. So, um, what I actually like about Fred's work is you can see that his work actually also uses um, neon light as like a lightning striking like a giant android. So, for a lot of artists, when we're asking them to design or create neon works, like they might think of. Uh, using the neon light as maybe um, maybe uh, to draw a silhouette of a character or something. But like for Fred, what I appreciate a lot is how he actually used the nature of the medium itself, like with the light to actually show the lightning stroke. So this is what I find uh, very interesting for uh, local craft or fading craft to um, collaborate with contemporary art. And the other one we have is Felix, and he actually has his work over there as well. <laughs> Amazing. Hi, good morning. Um, so my piece is um, the dance of the Chinese unicorn. Um, so this is, um, a ch normally people see the sort of dancing of the dragons or uh, the dancing of the lions. So I grew up in Cheng Yi. Um, I'm, I think I'm the sixth or seventh generation of the Aboriginal villages here um, in Cheng Yi, not Vietnam. <laughs> Uh, so, so, uh, so one of the things that um, I grew up with was every New Year's uh, there will be, um, as a Hakka village, we have the dancing of the unicorns. Um, I don't think there's an actual translation of what it's called. It's called um, Keilun in Chinese. Um, so I just call it the unicorn because it's the most, and I like unicorns. Um, so, so and actually, a lot of my peers, um, classmates, haven't actually been to an actual Chi um, Hong Kong ancestral hall or haven't seen an actual Chinese unicorn dance. So one, when Karen invited me to do this project to draw something about my neighborhood, that was the first thing that came into mind. Um, and uh, when I was told that I can collaborate with Master Wong, um, I wanted to do something that um, combines both to sort of uh, my my traditional uh, my traditions and um, his his work. Um, I made a more simplistic uh, light because I thought I had to do it initially. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, turns out I just gave him the drawing and he did it. <laughs> um, but we added a, a flickering of the light. So when in the actual um, the actual artwork during the exhibition, um, it flashes and it's just to make it look like it's actually dancing. Um, so yeah, if you ever walk past a village, um, um, please go to like an ancestral hall. It's a lot of delicate work and drawing inside. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and what, yeah, and what I like about Felix's work is actually there. You can see there's a neon framing. So, like for a lot of Hong Kong people, for us, it's very normal to have 
neon signs with the neon frames. But we realized for uh, like maybe foreigners, they will find it very odd. Why do you have to frame it? But that's like also uh, kind of like an aesthetic for um, our commercial street sign where Felix actually put into his work as well. And, and uh, for our studio, we are actually doing like, like I mentioned, we're doing non-profit art programs that collaborates with different fading crafts and artists. And recently we are launching um, a new program called Classic Craft Modern Meaning, where we seek to find modern adaptation for these crafts so that we can grow with them and actually gives them a new purpose with art. And um, we have actually, um, we are doing like an artist in residence program where uh, the masters, they're teaching our artists different skills. Like in this case, this is a mahjong tao carving. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this part has been finished and our artist is gonna create their artworks that is gonna be shown on a tram next year. Nice. And like Fred was mentioning, and um, we are also collaborating with um, Cheng Lok Choi, uh, that Lindsay has mentioned earlier. Uh, Fred and another artist, local artist, Go Hung, has been um, learning these kind of bamboo making skills with the master. And this really hard, like we never believed that the master actually started all his birdcage from scratch, like from a real bamboo, and how he actually layered and cut them off. And even for Fred and Go Hung, they spent like, like uh, two hours to just sharpen the knife so that they could use it. So um, we're also like organizing public sessions um, at Tong Nam Lo, uh, an art boutique hotel in Yang Mate, tomorrow and like uh, for the following month so that you can have conversation with Fred and the masters on how to, uh, and on how they will view on like birdcage making. And um, we're also having potential walking and drawing tool with Lindsay as well so that our artists will also like guide you with some crafting and making skills as well as like visiting different masters uh, studios so that you can learn more about our Hong Kong culture and in a, maybe in a different angle. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Before you leave, please grab a slice. It's very light coconut cake. I understand it's the morning. Um, and it's provided by Butter, which is the new Black Sheep Bakery. Um, so definitely go try it. And um, yeah, have a great weekend. See you next month. Thank you.